I'm Donna Sweet. I'm a physician, a general internist that got into AIDS care in 1983 when the first patient that I know of came back to town with Kaposi sarcoma. My name is Deborah Robinson. I'm a registered nurse at Via Christi St. Francis and I'm a med surge nurse at this time. I have taken care of HIV patients since I started in 1980. I was following it just academically, reading the papers about this new disease that was out there. No one really knew what was going on. We didn't know what caused it. There was no test. For for the most part, for most people, it was simply watchful waiting to see what they were going to end up getting infected with or, sh or showing in terms of their infection. People were just so afraid of them. They were just, just afraid to touch. You know, it was a big thing in Hollywood. You couldn't kiss, you couldn't, you know, hug, because they were afraid. Everybody was separated. People were, they really were put in a private room no matter what, separated from the whole, almost community. It was a terribly difficult time, not only for patients, but their families and healthcare providers. People got pretty burned out. Early days, we, we had very little to offer. Um, again, we didn't have any drugs until we got Zidobidine in 1987, it was approved. Uh, as it turned out, we used that probably in too high of a dose and made some people sicker rather than better. It was a time when the average survival for somebody with AIDS was around six months. By the time we got Zidovidine, DDI, and D4T, the next two drugs in the early 90s, we could get the lifespan out to about 18 months, but it was very unlikely that people would live longer than that. Really, there was no one else that was taking care of it. I got known as the AIDS doctor, largely because of the speaking and the fact that I was taking care of the early patients. One of the most onerous I think events that I remember was a young woman in southeast Kansas. This young woman's husband died and the community um, knew that he died of HIV AIDS. They wanted her out of town. It was a very small community. Uh, one of the first things that happened was that she was no longer able to go into the grocery store. The owner didn't want her touching the food that his other patrons would have to eat. She had two small kids and the daycare center would no longer let her leave them there. In spite of the fact they didn't know whether the children were infected or not, and indeed they were not, she was not even infected. But that didn't stop the community from stigmatizing her to the point that she was really feeling you know, put out in the sense of having to move. But the thing that finally did it for her, somebody killed a cat and hung it on the front door. I know a family and they have a child that was HIV and they have just totally separated from them and I think that's really sad because I mean we all really do need to be a part of this world and some of the situations these people have been in that, that have gotten HIV, it was not their fault and I don't think they should be held like that. I mean everybody deserves a chance. Back then I got a few letters from people who said thank you for your help in the past, but we just can't come into a place where we might come into contact with that disease, and so we're finding another doctor. Now, they're starting to socialize it a little bit more. They really are. They don't seem as afraid. They are afraid, but not quite as afraid as what they were back in the 80s. It was always a difficult discussion when you had somebody come in late stage with pneumocystis pneumonia, I knew I could probably get them four to six months and occasionally somebody lived longer than that. But if they needed support, we got them hospice early uh, and not many people outlived the six months. I did have a friend that did die of HIV, and, uh, but we all stuck with him. We stuck with him through and through till the time that he died. You've got to have a support with anything. It's not just the HIV disease. It's with any disease process. It really is. You've got to have family support. That's how people make it through any process of any disease process. Thirty years ago, when we first saw patients with HIV and AIDS, we had very minimal if anything to offer them. They came out with one pill, they had to take it every four hours, even set alarms at night, wake up, take it, made them sick. As time went on, there were more and more options, but more and more pills that they had to take on empty stomach with meals. I had one patient that would literally take like 10 pills three times a day. Thank goodness we've come a long ways. 30 different medications, I should say, available now. A lot of those are single tablet regimens, 
which mean all three drugs are in one pill that they can take, and they're tolerated so easy compared to what we used to offer people. People can tolerate them, they can work on them, they don't have to be um, off work or take them at, only at home. So much better for the patient and so much more rewarding for the healthcare provider because we can see them getting so much better and they feel better and therefore they keep appointments and come in for their lab work and are more adherent with their medicines. It's important for our patients to take their medicines every day so that they can become virally suppressed, which means you know there's no detectable HIV in their blood. That's important because uh, they're much less likely to spread it to others if they're undetectable. Um, and also they're able to live a longer life. At KU, we're proud we have an 85% uh, suppression rate among our HIV patients. The life expectancy for Patients that are virally suppressed is the, essentially the same as someone that's not HIV positive. Although we have come uh, a long way with HIV care and treatment, um, there's not a cure. We have PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which helps prevent high-risk individuals um, from contracting HIV. It's a one pill a day regimen. Um, it's actually a part of the HIV regimen um, to help prevent uh, the spread of HIV infection. It is available through our clinic. Um, they just need to make an appointment. Um, if they're uninsured, I do believe it's a $50 copay to be seen. Otherwise, it would just be a copay visit. The medication is costly, but Gilead, the pharmaceutical company that makes and manufactures uh, Trivada, is, um, has a very good assistance program. So a lot of our patients, if they're not able to afford the medication, they can go through the assistance program. The test we use um, to screen for HIV can actually detect the virus as soon as two weeks from exposure. A lot of people can uh, contract HIV and not even know that they have it uh, because they just don't uh, have any symptoms that are out of the, out of the ordinary. Um, and so it's really important for everybody to, to get tested for HIV because if, if you are positive, then we can get you um, into care sooner. And by getting you into care sooner, it actually is a better outcome um, on your immune system because the virus has less time to damage your immune system without um, the medications that can prevent it from doing so. Here in Wichita, um, there's a couple places that you can go to get tested. Um, you can go to Hunter Health, Positive Directions, the Sedgwick County Health Department, and of course here at KU. No appointment necessary um, at these four places. You can just walk in and somebody will get you tested. It just takes about 20 minutes. You come, it's free at most of these places, um, and it's just a finger stick. And within, like I said, within 20 minutes, you should have a, a pretty accurate result, uh, whether you have HIV or not. When I tested positive, it was in 2008. They told me to sit down and I remember hearing it. And to me, cause I wasn't like really educated on it. I was kinda, I was scared. I was, I, it was a whole bunch going on by like I couldn't say anything, but a few days, you know, I'd be on track, I'd take my medicine, but then it was just a few days, and because I don't like taking pills anyway. I really didn't care, because in my mind, because it was, a, I had an ignorant mind state of the whole thing, like, I wasn't gonna get better, I wasn't, it was just, I got it, I'm screwed, oh well. There are consequences if you don't take them, it's gonna be rough, you already think it's rough. Man, it gets even worse, you start to waste the way it was destroying my brain. And it was like people you see, you know, with full blown AIDS, get lesions on their skin and you can see it. But that didn't happen to me, it was, it happened on my brain. My eyes would be sensitive to light. Um, I can't move real fast or I'll get 
second job, my family, before they knew what was going on, it was like, they saw me as, I was like a drunk person. I couldn't walk straight. My speech was learning. It's way worse, like all you have to do is just take your medicine, like you know, having HRV is not a death sentence. Now I really, I take my meds every day. I still don't like to take pills, but you gotta do it. I, I try to live healthy, like uh, stop smoking, stop getting drunk, you know, start caring about you know, my health, you don't have to end up like me. It, and it sucks, but you have to do it. It's, it's not the end. For me having HIV, I mean, back then I didn't know nothing and it ruined every, my whole view on everything because I allowed it to consume me and to take over, but I had to want to live. Before that, I didn't want to, but now it's like I have, I, I want to.